first from the government here dr partama and uh, mr calderon we are waiting for them for him and second we are going to learn from the scientists here andrew campbell from asia and professor uh, Boer from ipp bogor institute of agriculture and then we also have uh, William Cordridge from the Nature Conservancy uh, World Office. He is from CSO, Civil Society. And then we also have a group of persons uh, dealing with uh, funding institution and supporting system from the World Bank. We have uh, uh, Mark Sedler from the World Bank. And the last but not least, we also have uh, uh, Ms. Likando from NDC Partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, actually our goals of this uh, sub-team is dealing with the uh, uh, expected out outcomes we already mentioned in our TOR. First, we are going to have a clear consideration in balancing economic, social, and ecological objectives in achieving NDC target. Second, common understanding of the role of forests in NDCs. This is our expected uh, outcomes. But uh, because of time limitations, we have a very, very short uh, time. We have to be finished around three o'clock for the seven different uh, speakers. So that's why uh, I like to invite all the speakers to uh, speak no more than eight minutes probably. And then I will give a key question for each of the speaker to give uh, our uh, what do you mean? Target of the uh, uh, discussion. So, without further ado, I like to invite Dr. Partama. He is actually the DG of Watershed Management and Protection Forest, but he also as an acting of Director General of Climate Change. So, the topic from Dr. Partama will be roles of forests and land sectors in Indonesia and digital jet direction and challenges. Actually, there are two main questions that I like to invite Dr. Partama to respond. First, why forests? And why this is important for Indonesia and DC? The second question, what is the biggest challenges in putting the forest and land use into the NDC target, and what would be the opportunities to achieve this target? Please, Pak uh, Putra, run eight minutes. Thank you, Pak Wahyudi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Being just an acting DG of climate change, uh, Director General, I guess my answer would be how an acting DG can answer. But, um, well, the question was uh, why forest and why forest is so important to uh, Indonesian NDC. I believe uh, everyone uh, knows the answer and it is very obvious. I guess I can put it this way. When, when we go back to the driver or the source of uh, emission. We identify sectors or uh, yeah, sectors uh, from which uh, the most emission come from. One of, one of them is uh, forestry, we know that. The others would be energy, industry, waste, and probably agriculture. So uh, if, if we want to significantly reduce our emission, then we must put 
the source from which emissions come from as the priority. So in our case in Indonesia, forest forest sector is uh, is the huge the, the largest source of emission. That that also relates to the size of our forest. We have 120 or 28 or 130. Sometimes we uh, say 130, 100. 25 or 135 million hectares forest. It also covers peat swamp forest, mangrove forest. With that size, forests can be both a very huge emitters and can also, if we do the right thing to our forest, can also contribute very significantly to the reduction of emission. So for that reason, Forest is the most important, if not the most, one of the most important uh, um, source, important sectors in our NDC. When we talk about forest, it's not only that uh, we talk about the size, actually. The content within the forest is also important. And uh, we know uh, tropical forests like uh, we have in Indonesia are the sources of uh, biodiversity and uh, from with that characteristic uh, our tropical rainforest actually uh, uh, something that can help us to adapt to the climate change so um, uh, it's not only the mitigation issue but also the adaptation issue uh, is related to forests the other reason is that because uh, uh, the double role, the multiple roles of forests play in in our uh, uh, living. Uh, we all know that uh, our forest is uh, remains uh, one of the largest our uh, of our uh, natural capital for the development. And uh, for that reason, we need to find a way how to have a delicate balance between treating our forest as a resource for economic development and also for um, carbon uh, emission reduction. So that's why I think it's uh, very, very important for us, uh, forests in our NDC uh, implementations. And like I said before, forests can reduce emission, but also forests can also remove not only uh, reduce the emission, but also forests can uh, remove the carbon from the atmosphere meaning to, or improve the carbon stocks. Um, uh, having said that, wh what is the challenge? What is the prognosis of our uh, NDC? There, of course, remains a lot of challenges, both internal and uh, external, Power UD. Uh, first, I should say that uh, we're still uh, working on improving our capacity, improving our technology, and also uh, finding finance uh, support in order to implement our uh, NDC. We still need to explore uh, global sources of uh, finance to support us, and we need to further explore the possible collaboration uh, with other uh, countries. Internally, we need to, like I said, uh, the unique role for a safe place, both as uh, the uh, national um, development capital and for uh, carbon emission reduction, we need to really uh, find the right uh, policies in order not to not to only uh, focus on one function of forest, but also uh, to cover the other function. We don't want to halt our development just for uh, the reason of this uh, NDC commitment. We still need to develop. A lot of people remain dependent upon forests for their living, and poverty is still a big issue in our country. So that's a, that's a really big challenge. And uh, 
one thing I also need to say is the the importance of still mainstreaming uh, this uh, climate uh, issue, climate action to the uh, whole stakeholders, whole components of uh, our country. So uh, I think it's already eight minutes, Pak uh, Wayudi. I end there and uh, I give you back this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pak Putra. Uh, it's thanks also your uh, time management. It's uh, just less than one minute that I give you. The second speaker is supposed to be Mr. Calderon from uh, the Philippines, but probably he is now joining with the ministerial uh, meeting. So next I'd like to invite Professor Andrew Campbell. Uh, he is the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, or ACR. ACR is very famous in uh, Asia Pacific region. The topic will be NDC target achievement and sustainability in form of food, water, energy security, and climate resilience. I like, I like to deliver my two main questions to Professor Campbell. First, how do you see roles of other land based sectors, such as estate lands and other agricultural land? in contributing NDCs, while the land conflict with forestry may be an issue. The second question, what recommendation at country and regional scale do you think the best for Asia Pacific countries? Please, Professor Campbell. Um, thank you, Pak. And uh, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, inviting me to this event. And congratulations for putting on such an important uh, event today. Um, as uh, Pat Putra has said, uh, there are very good reasons for uh, looking after forests and for managing forests better. I started my career as a professional forester and I still have a farm with 120 hectares of woodlots. So um, I have a personal interest in this subject. Uh, and I have a very strong belief that well-planned perennial vegetation has a crucial role to play across all land tenures, not just in the forest estate. And when you look at the nexus between food and water and energy against a backdrop of climate change, what, there are very few win-wins, but one of them uh, is getting productive use of uh, trees in agricultural landscapes. Uh, it's very important for both climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. And sometimes I think we distinguish between those two words too much. In the long term, the best adaptation option is mitigation. Um, so there are many ways of getting trees and shrubs into non-forest land, into agricultural land. Agroforestry, um, whether it's for grazing animals or other products, farm forestry for timber or for energy, um, forest gardens for many uh, food crops or traditional systems for shading coffee or, or uh, cacao. Bioenergy plantations will become increasingly important as we decarbonise and move into second and third generation biofuels. And of course, there's a significant role for reforestation and forest regeneration for biodiversity and watershed protection. So getting more trees into rural landscapes is intuitively and conceptually attractive. But that's been the case for a long time now and yet we are not seeing the scale of uptake, uh, even in rich countries like Australia. Uh, there is still a net deforestation, not a net reforestation. So we need to ask ourselves, why is that so? And uh, in ACR, my organisation, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, 
We have funded work on this uh, and in my previous career also. We need to understand that getting trees into agricultural landscapes uh, has upfront costs, both in cash outlays, but also in the opportunity cost of the land and the labour. People could be doing other things with their time. It requires higher levels of management skills. Um, there is usually a gap between the time you plant the tree and the time you get a return from those trees of at least several years. Sometimes the perceived gap is larger than the real gap, but the perception is the important thing. There is an uncertainty around future returns and future earnings. Uh, people can't be confident that in five years' time or 10 years' time or 15 years' time they will get the benefit, especially if there's insecurity of land tenure or worries about being able to protect the trees from grazing or from fire or from incursions by other people. So if you put that, those constraints together, you need to come up with solutions that anticipate those problems and that deal with those problems. This means a clever com uh, combination of good incentives with the extension and training to implement them. And importantly, not just a focus at the individual farmer or individual farm level, but close attention to the community or social level because ultimately we need to change social norms. Uh, and this has implications for the type of research or science or extension that we're doing. Uh, there's a natural tendency for the scientist or the policy maker to focus on the most degraded areas and to try and start in the problem areas. Uh, my personal view is that that is too hard and that you would get greater success in the long term if you start in the areas where the people are most willing, where the land tenure is most clear and where you have the opportunity to make a good difference, uh, an improvement quickly. Uh, and then you can spread out into the more difficult areas, but from a platform of success. Pay really close attention to livelihoods. If people cannot make a living with the new alternative, they will not persist with it and they'll undermine it. Anticipate the threats. Focus on interventions that improve food security and climate resilience. And I think there are solutions out there. And the work of C4 and of ICRAF has shown many of those solutions. It's really important that we track the progress very closely and develop better measurement systems. And if we're going to pay people for uh, providing um, uh, Red Plus or environmental services, we need to make sure that those payment systems deliver and are comprehensive and are timely. Where we do have success, we need to be much better at celebrating the success and promoting it really widely across multiple platforms, especially social media, and be ready to scale up and scale out from those islands of success. That scale up and scale out will almost inevitably involve the private sector and the non-government sector. And then you need good governance to ensure that success is replicated and not undermined. The overarching policy environment needs to be enabling and encouraging rather than constraining. So there's a, there's a menu. Uh, I must say in reflecting upon that, that when I look at my own country, uh, a rich industrialised country, we have not managed to put all those ingredients together and sustain them through time in Australia. So I'm not saying that it's easy, but our technical understanding and the toolkit we have uh, is getting better all the time. And as earlier speakers said, our ministers and uh, Paputra, we will not be able to meet our NDCs if we don't have forests uh, at a really high place in our priority list. 
the opportunities are huge. The potential co-benefits are immense. And the alternative is a disaster for this generation and future generations. So in my view, we don't, uh, we don't have a choice. We just have to make it work and we have to go for it and try very hard for the rest of our lives for the benefit of our future generations. Thank you very much, Professor Sandro. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Rizaldi Bur. He is an executive director of CCROM, the Bokor Agriculture Institute. Uh, he is going to talk on the topic of implementing NDC, implementing NDC target under MRV challenges and principles on land-based sectors. So there are two uh, questions I'd like to deliver to Pa Rizal Dibur. First, what are the challenges in implementing MRV for NDC achievement from forests and NDC achievement in general? The second question will be, what would be your scientific recommendation related to the MRV implementation for NDC from forests? Please, uh, Rizaldi. So, before continuing, I'd like to inform you that in, on the side, there will be a kind of reminding time. There is two, one, or zero, means if two, you still have two minutes and zero means uh, stop. Thank you. All right. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Pa Mayuni, the chair. So, now I, clear, I will talk and give my views a bit on the issues related to the technical part of the NDC focusing on forestry and land use sector. As you may aware that Indonesia uh, emission by 2030 is going is going to go to up to 2.87 gigaton of CO2, which is more than double of the emission level of 2010. And then if we look at what are the source of the emission that make the Indonesian emission will be very high in, by 2030, where it is 60% come from land use chain and forestry, in particular from peatland and also from pit fire. But of course, the deforestation is also one of the big source of the emission. And of course, the effort that we are going to do to reduce the emission from this source should be able to be monitored. And I think the result that we are going to report should be to be reliable. And I think this is one of the big challenges. Why I say it's become a big challenge? Because it will involve many aspects of it, institutional aspect, including also human resources, human capacity, and also, of course, the methodology itself. And we know that in the context of Indonesia, many agencies are responsible for collecting data related to the action on mitigation action on uh, forestry and land use change sector. So back into the two questions that has been mentioned, and I think if you don't mind, Probably it's better to see the point that I just prepared so everybody can also see. So, of course, there are three main issues related to that, as I mentioned. One is, of course, about the institutional aspect of it. So, what I call the institutional arrangement for measuring, monitoring, and reporting the activity data. Yeah. And then the, the second aspect, it is on the issue related to the methodology. It is about including activity data and also about the emission factors. And the search, of course, related into the issues. Can you get quick quickly? Uh, issues related to the, can you go up just quickly? human capacity and financial resources. In the establishment of MRV institution in Indonesia, 
it is very clear that everybody are actually welcome. I mean, to report the contribution in regard into the effort for reducing emission from reforestation and also from action related to mitigation on land base. And then it could be based on jurisdiction, which means that jurisdiction can report, but can also individual, can also be uh, private, can also communities. But the challenge is how actually they are going to report the data. And I think this are the big challenge that need to be solved. And I think if we go into the principle and under the COP, of the, uh, COP decision, it is very important that the methodology is being used in developing the baseline emission and methodologies being used for reporting the result should be consistent. And of course, we also need to be transparent and also need to show what are the improvements that, that we are going to make gradually to, in, or, in order to reduce the uncertainty. And then if we go back into the way that the systems now uh, operate, actually the, the source of the uncertainty is still not really in place yet. And so this is very important to understand what are the key source categories that contribute into the emission from land use base and forestry. And I think we have done some of the activities on that, and then we have evaluated what are the key source of the emission come from land base and forestry. But of course, as I mentioned before, there are two big source of the emissions. One is come from the pit fire, pit decomposition, and the other one on the, from the deforestation. And that the, the waste data is being collected, some of the data will be able to be monitored through the spatial, but another one, the system that we are having now is not good enough to look at more detailed type of uh, land use category data that can capture the contribution of the activities related to the mitigation on this sector. So this way, there should be also a methodology need to be developed how we can combine the data on spatial-based data with the point-based data. And I think what, this one of also a big challenge. And of course, um, we know that the National Forest Monitoring System is already in place. It is very good re, uh, infrastructure that we have now, but we also understand the capacity of the system in order to disaggregate the activity data to a level that which is able to capture many initiatives implemented by many sectors uh, related to the land base is also not, not, it's not yet there. It's not there yet. So based on that, uh, I think what we'd like to, to recommend how actually we can improve the MRV system in order to be able to monitor and track the result and the impact of the implementation of the mitigation action. As you can see, just we go quickly, and I don't think I need to see this, just go quickly. So one, back into the issue of the institution, institutional procedure in reporting the data. We know that, for example, there are many initiatives that contribute into the emission reduction. In the private, there are technology, for example, reducing impact logging, which is now is going to be declared as one of the initiatives from the government of Indonesia, but still not very clear how the data is going to be collected, it's being reported and being used uh, for um, measuring the, the result of the implementation of that program. And we also have a number of uh, policies related to the mandatory of certification, whether it is related to palm oil or also related to sustainable forest management, there are also impact of this policy. But again, the active data that connect into this kind of the policy is not really uh, um, identified yet. I think the big point and the big issues that need to be, uh, to be implemented is to do it in this assessment, one on the assessment related to key source, and then the second, to understand what are the connection of the activity data with the mitigation action is being implemented. So what does that mean? So all the stakeholders need to also to understand which part of the program actually contribute into the emission reduction. By knowing this, actually they know what type of the activity data that need to be collected, what are key accuracy procedures that need to be implemented, and what are the procedures for reporting, and I think regulation on this also need to be in place. And I think uh, we have many regulations already there, but I think there are some, still many uh, gaps that need to be filled in in order to allow for everybody and for any entity who actually um, 
contribute into the implementation of mitigation action on the land base can report their, uh, their activity data and at the end go into the registry system that has been uh, developed by the government. And I think uh, for the time being, so I just would like to end into that, but one of the most important one actually for the key source category, the uncertainty is very crucial. And I mentioned before, it is very important also for the, for the uh, agency who are in charge for reporting to really implement the uncertainty assessment. So what does that mean? We need to understand what are the source of uncertainty. If we know that actually we can set up plan how we can improve the quality of our activity data that at the end can be used for reporting uh, the impact of the action. So I think I would like to end and then we can have open discussion later on uh, on that and we can share also the experience that we are now having with the World Bank in developing of RP, uh, RPD uh, for East Kalimantan, with, also with the TNC of course. Thank you very much. For the next uh, speaker will be William McCordray from TNC. The topic, uh, William is Director of Climate Strategy, the Nature Conservancy World Office. And he is going to say, dealing with the role of biodiversity conservation, linking to the NDC achievement from forests. Uh, the question will be, what will be the role of biodiversity conservation linking to the NDC achievement from forests? And the second question, what will be required at minimum stage to exhibit the biodiversity conservation roles on the NDC achievement? Please, William. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Park, and uh, thank you for the introduction. And thanks to the Government of Indonesia for hosting all of us uh, here. Uh, it's a fantastic event, and, um, and it's, it's a really great opportunity for people to come together and, and learn and share experiences. So thank you. Um, I'm going to come to the issue of biodiversity, but I just want to offer a few reflections at the beginning about uh, NDCs. And I think, I mean, it's been emphasised here by a number of speakers, but just to re-emphasise, the simple truth is we can't achieve the Paris Agreement goals without forests. It's just that simple. Uh, we don't get anywhere near, if you look at the modelling, you don't get anywhere near the staying below two degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees, unless you're putting every single opportunity on the table and, and making the most of all those opportunities, including um, sustainable management and protection of, of forests. Um, in fact, my colleagues at the Nature Conservancy released a report last year, a peer-reviewed report, showing that the full potential in the land sector, what we call natural climate solutions, including farming, uh, forestry and wetlands, uh, could deliver around 37% of, of what's required to keep global warming below 2 degrees. So it's a major part of the solution. Um, sadly, to date, it's still a, an under-realised part of the, the solution. Uh, it's, it's inspiring to see what's happened in the energy sector in recent years with the dramatic increase in the investment in re renewable energy and the dramatic decrease in the cost of renewable energy has really sort of unleashed a, a new wave of investment globally. We haven't seen that happen yet in the land sector with respect to tackling climate change. Uh, we looked at it and, and I think the Minister from, from Australia this morning, Josh Frydenberg, said it was about 1% of the green bond market at the moment. Um, we looked at the media coverage of the land sector in, in the context of climate change. It's, it's about 2% of the media coverage. So it's not getting the share of the conversation that it needs. It's not getting the share of the investment it needs. And I think it's really up to, up to all of us to, to help change that. Um, it is really encouraging, though, in Paris that a not, quite a lot of governments did put what we call natural climate solutions or the land sector into their NDCs. And it was even more encouraging this morning to, to see the Indonesian government issuing a, a strategy for implementation of their NDC. That level of detail doesn't exist in all countries yet, so it's, it's encouraging to see Indonesia doing that and taking a, a leadership role there. Uh, and in fact, that's, that's one of the key recommendations from my point of view is we do need to see that next level of detail about how governments will be uh, implementing those NDCs. Um, it's also critical, just, just a few other sort of broad remarks, um, I think to be taking an integrated approach, to so not just look at it as the role of forests, but also looking at all the different competing demands for, for land use, including infrastructure and the role of infrastructure planning, urbanisation, um, agriculture, energy demand and, and livelihoods. And we see 
Uh, too often, I think, that we, we fail to take that sort of integrated approach with, when, when addressing this issue. We, we look at it through a siloed approach or a, a particular lens around just the forestry sector, which is important and it's critical, but you've also got to look at the other pressures on, on the landscape. Uh, I want to echo Andrew's point around the importance of adaptation as well. And getting carbon stored properly in the land sector and improving our management of carbon in the land sector can also help us to address other issues with respect to adaptation. For example, watershed management. If we have an increased investment in reforestation and forest management in watersheds, you can reduce flooding, you can improve water quality and water supply for cities and, and other regions. So critical part of the, the dialogue. It's not just about carbon, it's also about many other benefits that, that we're pursuing. The other one that um, is often uh, sort of ignored or not looked at is the role of mangroves. Um, mangroves store a huge amount of carbon per, per hectare uh, and also provide a whole lot of other benefits for coastal communities as they, for resilience but also for food security um, in, the more, in the more immediate term. Um, I, I want to say as well just about the, to date I think one of the challenges in this space has been that it's, it's been a little bit of a, a conversation between climate policy people. Uh, and we need to change that. We need to have a conversation that brings in the private sector, that that takes the conversation to something that to, to to a level that's relevant to the landholder. So it's often not relevant to a landholder to be talking about carbon. It's more relevant to be talking about something they're dealing with in a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and in some instances, it may mean not talking about the carbon benefits, talking about other other benefits altogether. Um, with respect to the 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 biodiversity issue, I I, I want to start actually by saying that. As an environment group, we often, you know, people assume that we're only interested in the environment, and I think it's critical to emphasise that actually people are critical, and we need to make sure that when whatever we're thinking about in terms of implementing a carbon project or implementing a biodiversity project, that we're first and foremost thinking about how is this going to impact on communities and people, and how do we bring them along in that journey? How do we make sure that communities, individuals, marginalised groups, and others are a part of that? that solution and benefit from it. Because I think the history to date shows us that if, unless we're doing that, you don't get the biodiversity benefits and you don't get the carbon benefits because people are, are not part of that, that deal, so to speak. The experience from the Nature Conservancy with respect to, to capturing biodiversity, I think one critical thing is taking a landscape approach to, to management of carbon, including through spatial, spatial planning. And, and one of a, 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 an example um, that was done in Barao in Indonesia actually was looking at uh, basically assessing all the opportunities in the land sector for managing carbon, um, for facilitating and supporting the growth of agriculture, um, for logging or forestry management, and, and doing some assessment of the cost effectiveness of different strategies. And it, it, which, what it showed is first and foremost, it's a lot cheaper and a lot more efficient if you do look at it as an integrated landscape and you look at it as a, as a whole rather than just looking at the carbon or one particular um, intervention. So taking that integrated approach is not only um, smart sort of from an academic point of view, it's very smart from a business or an economic point of view as well. Um, it also, taking that jurisdictional approach also allows you to address some of the concerns around carbon leakage. So you're not only getting potential benefits for, for biodiversity, but also for, for carbon. Um, and also uh, risks uh, fragmentation. So uh, avoiding a, a situation where you're, you're having a highly fragmented landscape, which we all know uh, is suboptimal from a biodiversity point of view, but it's also suboptimal from a, from a carbon, carbon point of view. I've got to wrap up, I've got one, one minute, so I'll just finally come to the issue of, of what's the sort of minimum level that we need. And I want to, uh, of, um, in order to, to assess the biodiversity or deliver the biodiversity benefits. And I think we do need to acknowledge that the Paris Agreement is not prescriptive. So it doesn't tell countries exactly what they need to be doing or how they need to be doing it. It's up to countries to, to come up with that. However, there are opportunities over the next coming years within the Paris Agreement context to bring in the conversation around, around biodiversity. And, and, and there's a lot of conversation going on at the moment about linking it to the Biodiversity Convention, to the Sustainable Development Goals, and getting that cross-linkage happening across the different, different frameworks, which would be, be encouraged. But the transparency rules under the Paris Agreement 
will encourage countries to bring more to the to the table and so it would be great to see governments being willing to share their lessons around the biodiversity benefits that they've achieved through improved carbon management and and vice versa and and starting that process of of sharing um, but it's not prescriptive it is going to have to be driven in increasingly by the governments themselves um, two two final points a, a critical one here and, and this is is actually very relevant on a day-to-day -day basis is do, do no harm. So make sure that in the pursuit of carbon, you're not having unintended consequences on biodiversity. That should be a minimum level. Uh, and it is something that's emphasised at a high level in different international agreements, um, sometimes reflected in national laws. But when it comes down to a project level, sometimes it, you lose sight of that. Uh, and just one final point before I wrap up is if we're going to achieve both biodiversity or put pressure on, on uh, uh, governments to achieve both biodiversity and carbon benefits, we do need to be making sure, um, to Rizaldi, Buck Rizaldi's point, that the MRV is affordable. You don't want to be in a situation where it becomes so costly to measure multiple benefits from a project that the project is no longer viable or the, the activity is no longer economically viable. So you've got to be looking for cheap or affordable and cost-effective ways to measure biodiversity and, and carbon. But thanks, Buck. Thank you, Will. Uh the next uh, speaker, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Mark Sadler, Practice Manager, Climate Funds Management, the World Bank. Uh, the topic will be climate finance and NDC target achievement from forestry land sectors in developing countries. Because uh, the then question is uh, dealing with two topic. NDC needs fund, so what do you think the funding availability for forestry and NDC achievements? And second, what is the World Bank innovations to understand the relationship between funding and performance? It's sometimes it's, uh, people call it chicken and eggs relationships. Please. Uh, thanks very much. Um, have we got the presentation? Just so I... We, we put some stuff on a, a couple of slides just to try and uh, explain what is uh, to just about everyone a very uh, complex and complicated space. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so climate finance obviously uh, has changed over the years and, and really where we are now is a long way away from, from the days of Kyoto. Um, can we get the next slide, please? Yeah. Um, and I think probably the easiest way of looking at it is you've really got three big buckets uh, of money that, that are out there to deliver on climate. Uh, so the, the base, you've really got money that goes to readiness and preparedness, and various of the funds finance uh, different activities um, as you go through uh, the three red plus stages uh, and or if you're working in other sectors. This pretty much uh, applies to all. And then you have the... the, the the two big buckets which really are uh, differentiated by finance that flows to you because you are undertaking economic activities that ultimately will result uh, in uh, climate co-benefits or, or positive outcomes to climate. And then the results-based finance, which is really you know, you, you've gone through an activity and then we are able to establish and prove uh, what, what it was that the climate outcome actually was. And of course the big difference is, and this is actually sort of the chicken and egg conversation, uh, is the idea of course the results based payments is to create the incentives for, for those economic sectors to move and deliver. The big challenge quite often is where is the actual financial flow to enable that activity to occur uh, to be able to deliver in the future. And I think that's been one of the challenges um, given that these markets and all this type of finance really started off with going out and looking to purchase carbon. Uh, but as we come through and towards Paris, uh, the, the, the pivot there starts to become more about climate action than necessarily the climate results uh, and actually how we deliver. And we're seeing that financial map uh, also change and the thinking around it change uh, as we move forwards. But as it uh, relates to forests specifically, and maybe get the next slide up, um, there are some real challenges uh, or questions as we move in that transition between Red Plus and the Paris Agreement. Uh, and so 
obviously Red Plus is based in and around uh, emissions reductions um, and the use of MRV and other approaches to, to actually show how the reduction in deforestation is actually uh, driving um, climate outcomes. Uh, and that was really captured under Paris in Article 5, which obviously referred to the importance of forests uh, and, and natural-based solutions in moving forwards and was really uh, very much an acknowledgement of, of the Red Plus system that was already in place. And then uh, immediately we get to Article 6, which talks about uh, you know, the difference between 6.2 and 6.4, which is effectively uh, international bilateral trade between governments versus um, you know, a new market mechanism um, that will come under Paris. But what we importantly established in Paris is, is to sort of put a marker in the map of where Red Plus was uh, and the fact that it is ongoing and that it has learnt an enormous amount that will actually be relevant to Article 6. But there will be, post-2020, a transition point, an inflection point about how uh, emissions reductions actually relate to uh, the trading environments that are seen under Article 6. So that's... Uh, a, a question that's really um, ahead of us, let's put it that way. I think the second thing uh, on the question of NDCs and climate finance is where the public sector liquidity in this space is really needing clarity between conditional and non-conditional pieces of the NDCs. Uh, so if you are effectively delivering on, on non-conditional, that isn't where uh, public sources of funds uh, are, are able to actually uh, interact. It becomes around the conditional space. But as you go through the NDCs, and over 100 of them mentioned land use and land use change uh, uh, as part of the NDC, uh, you start seeing uh, that there's still quite a lot of work to be done. Uh, a, in definition of the conditional and non-conditional. Uh, B, in terms of uh, the, the actual allocations across them. And so we really do need to do that work to be able to then uh, get better clarity about where public sources of climate finance will actually be able to engage in people's NDCs uh, or not as it relates to forests. And ultimately, of course, um, under Red Plus, under Warsaw, we, we've set up uh, some very, very um, tight, stringent, guidelines uh, and requirements in and around environmental and social uh, integrity uh, of these projects. And then the question then comes, okay, how will this fit ultimately under whatever approach is taken under Article 6 in, in relation to uh, the various different approaches, I don't want to get too much into it, it's the subject of the negotiation, but the different approaches to uh, accounting, baselining uh, and inventories uh, and, and how this will actually relate. You've got a very uh, structured system, of course, under Red Plus, uh, and how is that actually going to fit? Uh, and then maybe last, if we could go to the, the, the next slide, there was this question about, um, you know, what have we seen or what have we learned in and around results-based payments? And I think one of the things that's interesting is uh, when you look at the non-land use, non-forest non sector, and you look for what, what innovations we're we seeing there, or what development we're seeing in climate finance, uh, the interesting thing to note is the, is the changing role of carbon. So increasingly in energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, a whole bunch of different spaces, the question uh, of the role of carbon in the financial flow is very different. It, it all very much started out as what is the price of carbon and that is my return. Now carbon is part of an integrated financial structure. So the question becomes how can the value of carbon, the price of carbon, unlock finance? And increasingly uh, in some of the other funds that we manage that, that, that are just there on the non-forest mechanisms, that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, where thinking of a cook stove project in Rwanda, uh, effectively the risk and the, the, the financial return that related to the cook stove project 
made it effectively un un unbankable. It's a private sector project. Uh, but when we brought in the emissions reductions that related to the cook stoves, not even to the, the reduced deforestation, but just the actual uh, uh, ultra efficient cook stoves themselves, it created a future revenue stream uh, that the project developer was then able to pledge to the commercial bank and all of a sudden it unlocked the finance. It basically drew down a large chunk of the risk, created a new uh, revenue stream to the project that, sudden, that made it bankable. Uh, and so increasingly on, on sort of, as I say, the non-land use side, uh, the role of carbon is becoming actually uh, the, the key to unlocking the finance. Now, I guess my parting question uh, to all of you is then in the various projects that you're looking at, is, is what does carbon, forest carbon, actually look like in those structures? And of course, ultimately, we, we've got a real challenge in there about what is the financial business return uh, for pure conservation. And, and that remains a major challenge, and I think that remains part of how we've got to actually change the dialogue. It's fine to note that 1% of green bonds go to the sector, 2% of, of the dialogue goes here. Um, but th those are the challenges that some of the other sectors faced when they started out. And how they got the 99% and 98% is they started putting solutions on the table that were financeable. And that really remains, I think, the, the, the challenge in this particular space. Uh, and it's in land use as well. It's not just in the forestry. But what do those financial packages look like? and how do we actually move them forwards. And then climate finance uh, will we'll, we'll find relatively easy ways to flow. Um, uh, the missing middle in terms of uh, commercial liquidity looking for opportunities is very large. It's a factor of global interest rates. Uh, the risk profile of some of these projects uh, remains challenging, but really when you push, uh, you need to be able to very clearly unpack what that risk is. Most of those risks uh, really are manageable with the tools that we have today, be it public sector risk, um, be it weather, fire related risk. Most of this stuff we can actually put to the market. Uh, domestic currency risk remains a major challenge, of course. Um, and the other big one is the, 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 long, the long return. But that uh, my argument would be is potentially where the value of the carbon money can come into play. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, the last but not least, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Lee Kando from Regional Specialist for Asia and Pacific NDC Partnerships based in Bangkok. Uh, the topic will be NDC target achievements and maintaining supports needed to receive. And the question will be, what are role programs and progress made by the NDC partnerships for tropical rainforest countries in achieving their NDC? The second question will be, how the, the NDC partnership foresee sustainability in supporting NDCs? How we hope to advance NDC implementation and raise the ambitions? Please, Lee. Makasih, Pak. Um, salamat siyang. And um, first and foremost, um, on behalf of the NDC partnership, we'd like to thank the organizers, governments of Indonesia and Australia for inviting us. Um, a few years ago, the developing countries announced in their IN, um, when announcing their INDCs, more than 85% of countries referred to agriculture and Lulu CF in their mitigation contributions. Many countries indicated forests to deliver adaptation and mitigation synergies, as well as economic, environmental, and social co-benefits. I fully agree with our colleague from TNC when he mentioned that the targets of the Paris Agreement cannot be achieved without forests. Now, why, is it, why are forests important? Um, three key reasons. They act as carbon sinks. They are a source of emissions through deforestation. Most importantly, it is a foundation for livelihoods and food security of a big portion of the country's populations, in particular, the poorest and the most vulnerable. 
To date, the NDC partnership has been facilitating forest-related requests through quantification. This means development of baseline data on emissions and vulnerability levels, and development of sector GHG inventory systems. Um, thank you. So what is the role of the NDC partnership? Who are we? Reinforcing the principles of the Paris Declaration for aid effectiveness on country ownership and transparency, and with the entry into force of the Paris Agreement, the NDC partnership was launched at COP22 in Morocco. The partnership is an early enforcer and strives to be a catalyst to drive NDCs into action. We are a connector. We bring together developed and developing countries, international institutions, and non-state actors to identify opportunities for collaboration. A couple of months ago, we had a workshop in Mongolia, and we were able to bring in the Mongolian Bankers Association. Um, considering that we have difficulties or that we still need to get some traction from the private sector, we consider this as a small feather on our cap. The NDC partnership is a matchmaker. We match demand with supply. Demand means government requests for support or national projects related to NDC implementation. Supply means services and resources that our international partners are bringing in. Um, we engage in three primary areas. The first one being technical assistance and capacity building through country engagement. Second one, knowledge and learning. Third is finance. Currently, the partnership has more than 70 countries and over 15 international institutions as members. Within Asia and the Pacific, we have 16 countries. Um, Indonesia, Philippines, Fiji, they're one of our early members. Next slide, please. Um, the bulk of our work focuses on country engagement. This means we come in and we dive deeply into the country based on the government's request. We facilitate support through a value chain of services. One, policy, strategy, and implementation. Two, budgeting and investment. The third, monitoring and evaluation. We have a country engagement strategy that guides our work, but it is flexible to country context. What we're doing is not rocket science. Um, it is, however, practical. There are five steps to country engagement. The first one being is that we need to receive a request from the government on what they would need in terms of NDC implementation. We don't plan to solve the whole NDC problem per se, but we would like to contribute to implementation of some subsectors. Stage two of the country engagement focuses on rapid assessment. This means gap analysis, stakeholder mapping, prioritization of needs and sectors, and alignment of the NDCs with national development plans, SDGs, green growth strategies, etc. Now the core of our country engagement work focuses on the partnership plan. It is a results-based framework that shows the demand, which I mentioned earlier, and the supply of services from development partners. From the demand side, this plan brings together line ministries and sectors and captures the work streams in which they have agreed to coordinate and focus their efforts on. From the supply side, this plan brings together international partners who are undertaking or who will soon undertake activities responding to the needs. Showing who does what, when, how, and at what price, the plan is used as a tool for coordination and transparency. Now, some countries we are working with, such as Vietnam, already has a plan for coordination. Same as with Pakistan, they had a plan for coordination, which they have requested us to help them revive. What we do is we don't try to create something similar, but we try to piggyback or build on existing frameworks and mechanisms. 
Through, the, through this partnership plan, one can see the gaps whereby nobody or a small amount of partners are supporting the needs. From the recipient country side, they use this framework for resource mobilization. And from the implementing partner or donor side, they use this to guide their future programming. The fourth stage of the country engagement strategy is based, focused on implementation of this partnership plan. And the fifth is review of the implementation, basically looking at what works, what does not, why, why not, and in what context. Third slide, please. Um, common support areas that, are, that have been requested from us across Asia and Pacific consists mainly of development of NDC roadmap by sectors, NDC mainstreaming, development of investment plans or bankable projects, support to national MRV system design and implementation, and strengthening GHG inventory. Now, one of the questions that um, I've been asked is, how does the partnership foresee sustainability in supporting the NDCs? The first being country-driven. We believe that to advance NDC implementation, race ambition, and sustainability of the NDCs, we must address country realities, align with existing processes and frameworks, and government, part, go, government ownership is paramount. Number two, not only through international funding, but also domestic and private sector financing. This means we need to mainstream work in existing systems, bringing ministries of finance, budget, and planning on board. One ministry cannot solve this problem. The principles for tracking progress and learning are at the center of the partnership plan, which improves accountability and efficiency. Now, the forestry sector warrants particular consideration in fulfilling country ambitions under the Paris Agreement. Taking hold of this transformative potential, we not only need the whole of government approach, but a whole of society approach. And this will only be achieved through a concerted and coordinated response. Makasi. Thank you. Ms. Kendo. Ladies and gentlemen, our time is uh, very limited, but it uh, seems to me that there are still around 15 minutes to give uh, the floor to raise the question for the speakers. So I'd like to invite uh, at least uh, three different speakers, different questions, very short. And please raise your hand if you need to uh, raise your question for the gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen here. No one? Sorry, I, I didn't see. Uh, Dr. Hokma first, and second, Dr. Uh, Faisal Faris. And, sorry, <laughs> ladies there. So, please, Dr. Hokma from ITTO. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. I have. I like first uh, congratulate the outstanding the speaker. Uh, I have one question to Pak Putra. Uh, within the NDC forestry in Indonesia, uh, what is the status of addressing or uh, the including the subject of uh, reducing emission from forest degradation, such as uh, fire and uh, unstable, unsustainable logging, and etc. So I'd like to know that, uh, how to address that is the second D. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roma. Second question from Dr. Paris. Faisal Faris. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, Faisal Parish from Global Environment Center from Malaysia. So uh, I think all of the panelists have highlighted the significance of uh, forest in terms of uh, sequestration and uh, storage of carbon and, and 
how in many of the countries uh, forest has been included in the NDC framework. Uh, since we're here in Indonesia, I, I think, has, as has been highlighted by colleagues earlier, one of the critical forest ecosystems are the peatland ecosystems. And I think that in Indonesia, a lot of work has been done. Uh, but I'm just looking at the uh, NDC strategy for Indonesia. And the uh, peatland issue and peatland emissions do not seem to be particularly highlighted in the strategy uh, in relation to the agriculture, plantation, and other emissions. And also for the NDC partnership, you mentioned you're dealing with many countries across the region uh, and, and globally that have very significant uh, peatlands and peatland emissions. And from what we have seen, peatland has not really been highlighted much in general at international level in NDC uh, processes. And I think uh, what lessons are there that can be learned from the experience here in Indonesia and applied to NDC processes elsewhere? Thank you. Thank you. And the third question will be, sorry, it's not so good. Thank you. Um, Virginia Young. I'm with the Australian Rainforest Conservation Society in Australia, uh, but working on a global project um, uh, that includes case studies in a number of developing countries aimed at um, delivering sustainable livelihoods for local and indigenous communities based on forest protection, and in particular based on protecting um, primary forests. Uh, and I, I found the, the presentations very interesting and, and um, uh, agreed with a lot of what Will had to say about working at the landscape scale and looking at how you integrate um, protection uh, and sustainable livelihoods uh, and what you do where in the landscape. Uh, but I, I was interested in the um, conversation around risk and surprised that there seems to be very little recognition as yet about the links between risk and biodiversity and that in fact in many ways biodiversity is not a co-benefit, it's a core benefit if you're thinking about the resilience of forest climate action. So if you are looking at restoration action, for instance, the sensible thing might be to look at buffering and reconnecting areas of primary forests so that you minimise emissions from primary forest and deliver the most resilient, least risky climate outcome. So I'm just interested in um, the panel's views on that kind of approach. Thank you, but uh, could you repeat your, indicate yourself and institution, please? The Australian Rainforest Conservation Society. Forest Conservation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I'd like to invite the, all gentlemen and ladies to give a response. Of course, first I'd like to ask Pa Putra because uh, Dr. Ma has uh, gave a question to him. Please. Uh, thank you, Pa Ayudi. I think uh, what I heard Dr. Okma mention is uh, uh, only the word fire is very, very clear to, to me. <laughs> so I guess uh, he was asking uh, what's, uh, what, what's uh, the, the importance of forest fire and what Indonesia will be doing, uh, what's the strategy in order to achieve the NDC given the danger of forest fire. Uh, that's my guess. But um, yes, uh, forest fire forest fire is very crucial uh, to us in Indonesia because it contributes uh, a lot of uh, emission. Uh, Dr. Rizal Dibur mentioned how our emission increased significantly in 2015 because of that uh, forest fire. So it's a uh, part of our priority uh, in how to suppress, how to uh, el uh, minimize uh, forest fire happening uh, in in Indonesia. One of the strategy, uh, which is a bold strategy, is to rearrange the our policy on the peat management, in which uh, we rearrange the land use of uh, peat uh, concessions. Uh, part of the previously uh, peat land used to be cultivated for 
uh, plantations. Now I, uh, many in many uh, concessions become uh, protected with land. So that's uh, I think a very bold uh, policy, and uh, it, it start to give result. And also the uh, technical uh, action undertaken, like uh, rewetting the pit through uh, canal blocking and. Uh, and also prevention, early prevention of uh, forest fire. So we believe uh, if this continue, then uh, uh, we, uh, the, the forest fire will, um, will not uh, possess a very uh, great danger in our uh, achievement of NDC, if this policy continue. I think that's what I can share pa, what you did. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Butra. Uh, the second question from Dr. Faisal, uh, who wants to Response is dealing with sequestration and so on. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I can't speak for the uh, presence of peatland in the Indonesian NDC implementation plan, except to say that uh, mangroves and peatlands are obviously extremely important for. Uh, as carbon stocks and and uh, and their removal and not just for carbon stocks uh, if you have intact mangroves you have a very significant increase in fish biodiversity and fish biomass compared to when the mangroves are displaced or degraded um, but the the same issues we spoke about about providing alternative livelihoods and ensuring that the conservation measures look after people are crucial for peatlands and for mangroves. Um, but uh, I would need the officials from the Indonesian government to talk about uh, the priority of mangroves and peatlands in the NDC's implementation plan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think mangroves are already a part of our land uh, sector. Yeah. Uh, you want to add more dealing with sequestrations issue? Yeah, uh, probably if I am trying to refer back into the issues that I just raised uh, about the importance of MRV uh, to measure the achievement of Indonesia in reducing the emission. And I also highlight one of the points mentioned by Mark uh, about the transition issues, which is about baseline greenhouse gas inventory and also with the, uh, with the reference level. And I think. Uh, these are the things that's one of the challenges. So if you would like, for example, looking at the risk of fire uh, for in Indonesia is quite high. And then we know the capacity of Indonesia nowadays for estimating the emission from the fire uh, still not good enough uh, to reach a level where actually the estimate is considered as reliable. Even though there are many methodologies that have been done, and I think we know actually we have a number of initiatives about methodology, uh, like price on developing methodology, how to monitor the emission from peat. And I think this is actually the progress and update of knowledge and methodology that should be adopted, I think, by the government. And how actually we can really test it. A number of methodologies has been developed recently to be able to measure that. And that should be, uh, should be taken into one of the uh, official approach and how actually we can really estimate that. And again, back to the issue of MRV, and then back into the issue of reference level and greenhouse gas inventory. And then if we know that if we go back into the Annex 1 country, for example, actually the reference will be the look at, at the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, but in the context of Indonesia, uh, developing countries, it's a bit difficult if we just rely on the greenhouse gas inventory. And as I mentioned in my talk, Actually, there are so many sources of the data, inconsistency in the data. Uh, Sometimes, uh, for some of the key source, the data is not available, for example. And then we do a very, uh, using a rough estimate. And sometimes, the same type of data come from different sources, might also have a different numbers. Uh, because uh, the ways the data is being processed is not the same. I think that's why we call it, uh, that's why, why we need to have set up reference level using more reliable data and then so very rigid process uh, how we can really use that one as a benchmark to see and evaluate the achievement. 
And we go back into the issue of RHEL, for example, for the fire, just we go back into the issue of fire, and then we are talking about what are the reference periods that we need to adopt. And then again, under the World Bank, for example, the case of the World Bank, FCPF, the methodological framework mentioned only just 10 years. But in the context of Indonesia, we use a longer, longer one. And then again, the challenge, when we go into the register system that has been set up by the government, and how are we going to treat that? So in the country itself, have a problem in terms of how actually we can distribute the benefit in fair, fairness, looking at a different way in defining the, uh, the reference level. And, and, and this is actually one of the issues, one of the challenges that now actually being addressed uh, by the government, how are we going to deal with this? And then the context of sub, uh, jurisdiction approach, for example, if there is an initi initiative and then jurisdiction, for example, register that well, have the activities as a result based payment activities, um, and then the reference level actually different from the one submitted by the national government into the UNFCCC, and then we, uh, and as, as you might also aware, that the government also now going to allocate the national emission uh, reference level into subnational, into your jurisdiction. And then now actually create kind of an approach, is one of, one of the regulations that need to be developed pro pro probably. So in the case, for example, if the amount of the emissions allocated into if the jurisdiction, it is higher than the reference level just developed by the, by, by the FCPF, for example, how are we going to treat in terms of the payments resulted from the activities? And these are the things, also in the opposite situation, for example, the allocation of the emission is lower than the one actually set up by the FCPF, for example. Uh, so these are also another challenge, and of course uh, there are many ways how actually we are going to solve this. Uh, one of the approach actually, okay, if we know that for certain of activities it might uh, uh, be effective in terms of the payment starting in the year 2018, for example. And then we know that under the national submission actually we start the result on 2013. So between the period 2013 to 2018, we still can refer into the allocation of the emissions. So there are many types of approach and uh, strategy going to be set up, and I think it's also very important to, to understand. Thank you very much for Then uh, I'd like to invite Will, uh, Lee Kendo, Mark Seder, or, or Will, regarding with uh, the last question on communities, landscapes, and resili resilience uh, issues. Please. Um, if I may, I'll reply to Mr. Parrish's um, question on lessons learned on NDC processes. Okay. Yes, so um, the NDC partnership has only started its full operations um, last year. So we haven't been in this country engagement business for a very long time, but we have several lessons learned already. Um, one of which is that we need to bring the whole of government approach, meaning we cannot work with only one ministry, but we need multiple ministries. What does this mean? We cannot only work with the Ministry of Environment, but also we need the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Planning. Now, we realize that um, in, a, in a lot of countries when the NDCs were developed, um, it was done or developed in a somewhat hasty manner, um, either by one agency or that there's not, there, there was no full consultative process. So one of the things that we have learned is that we need to find a way or an angle that will bring various ministries and sectors together. How do we do this? Um, what we do is we, we look at the NDC, we look at alignment between national development plans, green growth strategies, and other, and medium-term development plans. Um, in some countries that we work with, we, we see that the NDCs are handled by a specific agency or a specific um, ministry. And our question basically is how do we bring the Ministry of Finance or Ministry of Planning on board. Now we look at an angle that will sort of align the process together 
and one of them would be the green growth strategy or the medium term economic plan. Through this, the stakeholders will realize that they have a stake in the NDCs. Um, another lesson that we have learned is that communication is important. We do talk a lot, but we do need to talk and ensure that everybody is aware and have an understanding of what we are doing. How do we do this? We facilitate workshops, we facilitate bilateral meetings, consultations. And I think the reason why I'm here is because this is a problem that has been existing for the past 20 years. But we try anyway. We try to coordinate better. We try to communicate better. And I think that's one of the ways that we can achieve the NDCs. Will and Mark. Uh, just quickly to pick up on Virginia's point and, and one uh, minute. One minute. Okay. Uh, basically, I think Virginia's point was that biodiversity. Sh I mean, part of her point, I think, was that biodiversity shouldn't just be seen as a a co-benefit but actually a core benefit and I think it's a very good point um, and I think we do need to also be acknowledging that perhaps to Mark's point to shift away from um, assuming that carbon is the is sort of the end goal of a particular initiative but it can actually be the vehicle to finance improved biodiversity outcomes or, or any other sort of outcome as well I don't know Mark if you want to add to that but I think that was the point you were trying to get across before about where the energy sector's got to now it's a it's part of the mix rather than the core the core driver yeah, please, Mark. Um, yeah, I mean, I, j I was just thinking wh whilst everyone was talking. What I what I think we're, we're seeing that's different as as opposed to, you know, going after forests as being the specific thing. When I look at where where we've actually seen interesting financial structures come together, uh, it's where forests have been providing a service to another part of the economy. I mean, one of the, you know, particularly well known examples is, is actually the uh, New York. Uh, water authority which realized that if they actually put money uh, into the forest they would actually spend less money cleaning up the water that's the very short version of that story and hence they put the, the they put a financial structure together to actually invest in forest con uh, conservation uh, you know another sort of example which I think is interesting so on the adaptation side uh, was a structure that was done recently whereby uh, we managed to bring together hotel owners to be putting together a financial structure with a major um, international reinsurer for coral protection. Because basically the coral was, was providing a natural barrier uh, which was actually reducing the risk to the hotels of A, losing the hotels, but B, their beaches uh, during uh, particular storm surges. And so the natural capital became worth an enormous amount of money. It actually ended up uh, making their reinsurance for the whole hotels and their loss of business much, much cheaper. But it came from people trying to protect the coral reefs. What they did is they came up with a tourism solution. So you know, the question around forestry is, what are the solutions that you're putting on the table apart from being you know, the biggest carbon sink on the planet? Thank you very much. Uh Gentlemen and ladies, so I think it's, uh, we have already finished our time, but before uh, finishing the sessions, I have some uh, points as a kind of, uh, it's not the summary or uh, conclusion of the session, but uh, more as the uh, takeaway messages from the sessions. First uh, message is uh, forest is eno enormously important and we would not be able to achieve Paris agreements without forest roles and NDC. And forests also take a role not just on uh, regarding with the carbon but also for life support system and livelihood. The second point is dealing with the MRV. MRV is crucial and those are including focus on institutional arrangement and regulations, human resources and methodology. And third, climate finance is uh, very important and we have already 
asked to Mark Settler and he gave a kind of good information about us that there is no issue on chicken and eggs anymore in dealing with the climate change uh, finance. He mentioning about the lesson learned from forest sectors through Red Plus is a kind of good start. And then NDC partnership is a good platform to start with to help country to deal with both technical policy and support. And achieving NDC requires partnerships, requires collaboration among agencies and stakeholders. These are our uh, points as a kind of takeaway messages from the session. And please give the big applause for the speaker here. Thank you very much. And before closing the session, I'd like to invite Belinda Marcono. Please come, Belinda. She is very, very give our uh, support, very important uh, significant roles in this uh, session. And also please, please give applause to Belinda as well. Thank you.